This lecture is about intra-abdominal infection. And here are some definitions. The main groups are infections of the biliary system, such as cholecystitis and cholangitis, infection of the bowel itself, such as appendicitis and diverticulitis, intra-abdominal collections or abscesses, peritonitis and bowel perforations, and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, or SBP, which is related to chronic liver disease. In terms of common etiologies, for community-acquired infections, then the causative organisms are usually from inside the bowel, such as enteric, gram-negative bacilli, like E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae, anaerobes, and enterococci. With hospital-associated infections, you have to think more broadly and include candida infection, MRSA infection, and bacteria such as Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. Diagnosis is largely clinical. It usually involves the surgical team, and it may be appropriate to do abdominal imaging, either with an ultrasound or a CT scan. In sick patients who are admitted, a blood culture is usually appropriate, and any infected material should also be cultured. This would include aspirates from collections or abscesses, or peritoneal fluid. Here is an approach to most intra-abdominal infections. First, you need to make the diagnosis. This means having compatible symptoms and signs, which is usually abdominal pain, plus evidence of infection, as with any bacterial infection, such as fever, raised white count or inflammatory markers, and compatible imaging. If infection is likely, then it's very important to achieve source control. So if there is an abscess, it must be drained. And if there's a specific bowel pathology, such as appendicitis, then appendicectomy must be performed. Once that's done, we can consider antibiotics. For community core infections, coamoxiclav, usually given intravenously, is an appropriate therapy. You should always consider a swift intravenous to oral switch when patients are able to swallow and absorb their therapy. Here are some alternative antibiotic regimens. If coamoxiclav is unavailable, then ampicillin plus gentamicin plus metronidazole gives a similar, similar spectrum of activity. Or ceftriaxone plus metronidazole is an alternative. In patients with severe penicillin allergy, ciprofloxacin and metronidazole might be appropriate. Turning now to spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Clinically, these patients have chronic liver disease and ascites, and they present generally with pain in the abdomen, they may have fever, and they may have encephalopathy. It's important to make the diagnosis before considering empiric antibiotic therapy. The key procedure is an acidic fluid aspirate, which, this, which should be sent to the lab for microscopy and cell count. If the cell count is greater than 250 cells per millimeter cubed, then the diagnosis is likely, but if it's less than that, the diagnosis of SPP is essentially excluded. The other way of diagnosing SPP is if culture of the acidic fluid is positive. Only once the diagnosis has been confirmed in this way should you start therapy. This should be with keftriaxone given intravenously for five days. It's common for doctors to add ampicillin or amoxicillin to this therapy on an empirical basis. But usually this is incorrect. In fact, there are a number of defined situations when ampicillin should be added. These are when the liver disease is cholestatic in nature. In patients who have fulminant liver failure, that is encephalopathy with coma, and in those who are unresponsive to keftriaxone after 48 hours. If none of those features are present, then keftriaxone alone is appropriate. In summary, there are a multitude of possible causes of intra-abdominal infection. Diagnosis is largely clinical and may be aided with appropriate imaging. Source control with an appropriate surgical procedure is vital. 
Empiric therapy with coamoxiclav may be necessary. And spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is overdiagnosed and empiric therapy should only be given once the diagnosis is confirmed by cell count of peripheral peritoneal fluid.